Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Agnieszka Otwinowska Kastelanitz, and on behalf of the University of Warsaw Excellence Initiative, I have the pleasure to chair the series of six lectures entitled Current Trends in Multilingualism Research. I would like to thank all the speakers who have agreed to take part, most of whom are members of the International Association of Multilingualism. I also want to extend my thanks to all the people from the University of Warsaw who are kind of behind the scenes, but who made my initiative come true. Today, for the opening lecture, we're welcoming Professor Rafael Beltele from the University of Freiburg. He studied and worked at the universities of Freiburg, Tübingen, Berkeley and Bern. In 2008, he co-founded the Freiburg Institute of Multilingualism, and he is a member of the board of directors of the Institute. Currently, Professor Bertele directs the MA programs in multilingualism studies and in foreign language pedagogy. His research interests cover different areas from cognitive to social aspects of multilingualism, such as intercomprehension, receptive competencies, and cross-linguistic interaction. Professor Bertele has published widely in the areas of linguistics, cognitive linguistics, comparative linguistics, and research into language acquisition and language education. He's the author and co-author of seven books and over 100 book chapters and journal articles published in English, German, and French. During the last years, he has focused on the empirical investigation of receptive multilingualism, on the acquisition of literacy skills in multilinguals, on spatial reference in bilinguals and multilinguals, and on individual differences in language learning. He has co-edited a special issue of the prestigious Language Learning, a top journal in the field of applied linguistics. The issue devoted to multilingualism research is just out in February 2021. Since 2020, Professor Bertele has been the president of the International Association of Multilingualism, which gathers European researchers interested in multilingualism studies and the acquisition of multiple languages. Rafael, Professor Bertele, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, Agnieszka, and the organizers for <clears throat> giving me the opportunity to, to give this uh, online talk, online lecture, it is obviously a great honor to be the one who starts this series of lectures with uh, fabulous colleagues who will follow. Um, the talk I'm going to give is a relatively general, but also relatively personal talk. It is obviously, I don't pretend to represent the whole field of multilingualism research. I will give you my view of the field a bit, little bit of the history of engagement of uh, scholars with multilingualism, and then some examples from our research, it's not just my research, the research of our group here in Fribourg in Switzerland. Um, I will try to be non-technical in this talk. You will see that I quite like uh, quantitative approaches, hypothesis testing, um, and if you're interested in the details, you can download a lengthy handout with all the references and figures. So if my slides are overpopulated, just relax, listen, and download the handout if you're really interested in. So I will share my screen now with you. All right. So as linguists, we would like to become famous for terms or theories, or at least found a school. So far, unfortunately, I haven't been very successful um, and I, my worry is that uh, my attempt to define multilingualism here will also be a rather unsuccessful attempt. Um, so my definition, which I think is a really lousy definition of multilingualism, is as follows. A multilingual is a speaker here who actually masters NYs. So the goal of this is not to become famous with this definition, but I would like to show you and explain why I think that the field will never completely agree on a Aristotelian or watertight uh, definition of what multilingualism is, a definition you know, involving necessary and sufficient criteria, because the field 
the nature of the subject of our study is extremely variable on several dimensions. So a multilingual is a speaker who actually masters N wise actually uh, refers to the X axis here, which basically means that the mastery of languages, and I'm sorry, this is very trivial, I know, but it's important to uh, point it out. The mastery of languages in the repertoire can be extremely skewed or unbalanced, or it can be perfectly balanced, although I think this is a rather exceptional case. So different degrees of proficiency, competence, mastery, whatever you want to call it. Wise, what are we talking about? On the y-axis, I map the question of what is the actual thing that we count in the, in the multilingual repertoire? Are we talking about proper languages? And please note that I'm not saying that there are good languages and bad languages, but there are good examples of the category of language, at least in our culture. So my native dialect, a Swiss German dialect, is not a good example of a language, but probably standard French is a good example of a language. That's what I mean here. But of course, we all know linguists cannot even define only on linguistic grounds what a language is. So obviously, dialects somehow need, need to appear in the definition of multilingualism. So maybe a multilingual with several dialects or at least one dialect is also multilingual. Or maybe we can go even further and say it's not just language as dialects. It could also be within language variability as in styles, registers. Uh, ways of speaking. So what I'm trying to say here is that multilingualism as a category, I believe, will never be entirely defined in scientific terms. Uh, and scientific, I mean, uh, you know, Aristotelian categories, as I said, with necessary and sufficient features. Uh, it is, however, a natural category. That would be my point here. Uh, with prototypical cases of multilinguals, think of the super polyglots. Those are probably prototypical uh, uh, multilinguals. They might not be uh, demographically the most frequent monolinguals out there. Um, maybe we could also um, just um, uh, stipulate that a person who speaks three or more languages, and standard languages, codified languages, uh, might be a good example for an, a, a multilingual, a prototypical multilingual. But they then we have other multilinguals, which we could call regular multilinguals with one dominant language and two non-dominant languages. So the difference here would be this one is really completely balanced, perfect in three languages. It exists, I guess, but it's very rare. Um, and, uh, and then there's limiting cases where, for instance, somebody has absolutely stunning command of one language with several registers within the language. So maybe there is such a thing as within language multilingualism. It's probably not prototypical multilingualism, but it exists. But maybe for some research questions, it is useful to count them uh, in, in the category of multilinguals. So I, have, I hope you understand. What I'm trying to say is that um, if we construe of multilingualism and bilingualism, and actually also something like a language, in terms of natural categories, like trees, like people's ideas about trees or birds, uh, then we understand that, okay, so there's good examples for birds and there's bad examples for birds. And probably the same is the case for multilingualism. So we have at least three dimensions of variability. There must be more. Um, the proficiency dimension, the what is it actually that we count? Should we count at all? And how many of them need to be there? That would be the end. Okay, so um, if we now look at how scholars and how societies or discourse in society engages with multilingualism, it is also useful to look back a little bit in time. Currently, of course, multilingualism is quite a hot topic in many places, in many countries, in, on many continents. In terms of policy, what should countries, schools, families uh, implement in terms of multilingual or monolingual policies? There's a lot of activism. Think of the minority language act activism. But there's also other things related to language, for instance, gender, race activism that also involves language policy. And of course, there's the whole question of schools. What are the best 
school curricula? Should they be multilingual, bilingual, monolingual? Um, so those are all social topics or issues. The scholarly fields, I'm a linguist, of course, I put linguistics first, but there's a lot of other fields, of course, that engage with questions of multilingualism, from pedagogy to sociology and history. So there's the scholarly engagement uh, with multilingualism is not just scholarship, and it's not just social policy, but of course, it's scholarship that is somehow also influenced by uh, social policy. Um, historically, I think we linguistics and th thinking uh, about language was to some extent uh, monolingual for quite a long time. So uh, think of Wilhelm von Humboldt, who is actually still an important figure in cognitive linguistics because he had uh, some really interesting thoughts on language and thought and the relationship um, uh, between the two. But on the other hand, he had a very, I think many of us perceive uh, his views on the relationship of nations, ethnically defined and languages as rather problematic. So here, I'm sorry, this is in German. So the Seele der Nation, the soul of a nation is expressed in the language. So as I said, Humboldt is still quite influential in cognitive linguistics, but I think cognitive linguists today wouldn't frame it that way anymore. So but you can see the importance here of nation, of the soul of a nation expressing itself uh, via language. Um, there is the idea in early linguistics um, that languages are systems in a very strict sense of the term. So perfectly designed systems. If you change one bit in the system, the whole system will adapt and will change. Um, I'm not saying here that um, this was a monolingual ideology about language because even the, the earliest um, linguists were very much interested, for instance, in variability and dialects and also contact. But there was this notion of the perfect, uh, perfectly uh, constructed system that lay paved the way, I guess, uh, for other quite extreme idealize, idealizations of what language is, perfect mastery, um, not performance, but real competence, idealized, monolingual, the idea of the native speaker that is still very, very dear to many in the field is also rooted, I think, in this thinking. And so as a consequence, many people in the early 20th century and also even earlier in the 19th century thought that bilingualism was detrimental to cognition. There are some often cited studies like from Wales, that one from, from Wales here, uh, and another one from, uh, from a Scottish scholar, Laurie, who says, if it were possible for a child or boy to live in two languages at once, equally well, so much the worse. His intellectual and spiritual growth would not thereby be doubled but halved. So as you can see, this is a rather negative view of bilingualism, and it is a very, very strict view of what a language is, what a system is, and therefore also what native speaker proficiency should be. I am not saying that in the past nobody was interested in bilingualism or multilingualism, but these are thoughts that shaped modern linguistics for quite a long time. So I think they are important to keep in mind. Um, on the other hand, and I count myself in there, people, many people today are interested in social dynamics, uh, yielding linguistic patterns, of course, Labov, sociolinguistics is important to mention here. So we're not talking about the nation, we're talking about social dynamics, um, giving rise to linguistic patterns. Um, and here, and this is important, so this is 19th century, very early on, some linguists, there were a minority, but some linguists were actually convinced that there's no such thing as an unmixed, pure system. All languages are mixed. This is Schuchardt, who was the founder of modern Creole studies. Um, today, I'm quite sure that most of us um, are familiar with this idea that bilingualism is good for the brain, is good for cognition, and is good for additional language learning. This basically, the, the impetus for this idea, I think, uh, came mainly from Canada in the 1960s. And if you look at, for instance, European policy documents, you will see that there's actually quite a lot of expectations regarding multilingualism, what long multilingualism and multilingual education 
should do and will do for individuals and societies. The plurilingual perspective, we firmly believe, uh, would help reinforce societies democratically, socially, and in terms of citizenship. So not only is there uh, benef beneficial effects on cognition, on aging, but also on societies. Um, so I hope you can see that we, we're dealing with two completely different views of language and to, we, we, could, we can say two different ideologies. And if you just look at the last point, so you can see com completely opposing views on what bi or multilingual education uh, does or doesn't do. Okay, so I'm not, so I think in the past, this one was more important than this, this one became uh, uh, more important more recently, but I am actually not saying that there's a clear, the past was this and, and, and the present is something new. I think the, this tension between those two ideologies still exists and will still be activated, for instance, in language policy discourses or also in scholars' practices, if you look at scholar, what scholars claim uh, is the case and what they then actually do. So I think th this is an interesting tension, but there is a tension there. All right, so we have what I propose to, to call essentialization of linguistic competence of the language and the monolingual bias in the past, and maybe today what we could call a celebrationist bias um, uh, a celebrationist view of bilingualism and multilingualism, where actually um, uh, monolingual, monolingualism all of a sudden becomes a disease that needs, that needs um, curing. Okay, so if we look at this um, um, figure here with the, you know, the, the, the social discourse on the one hand and the scholarly fields, what we see is that we have on the one hand this monolingual bias um, that pulls towards, you know, standardization, monolingual uh, language, high proficiency in one language, and we have this, this as a reaction to this bias, um, you know, what I call the celebrationism, um, uh, celebration of bilingualism and linguistic diversity and multilingualism and all these things. So in my talk, I will not focus that much on social questions of multilingualism. I will mainly focus on individual differences. They only gave me 45 minutes, so I can only talk about one thing, but I think it is also very interesting to look at social uh, language policy discourse and all these things, but I won't have the time to do it here. So in terms of individual um, multilingualism, I think the field, there are a certain number of points on which I think we in the field agree. We, I think nobody would disagree with this, with the claim that the locus of contact is the bi-multilingual individual. That's where the languages are actually in contact. Um, but that there are also social constraints that are very important in the way bilingualism, multilingualism is shaped and lived and expresses itself. I also think that it is pretty uncontroversial that one of the central things that we do in our field is systematically investigate how the languages in the repertoire interact. The term that most of us use is cross-linguistic influence, sometimes called transfer also, or interference, a more negative term. Um, I think pretty much everybody agrees that this is a central uh, field of inv investigation. And related to this also, I think we all agree that multilinguals are not simply multiple monolinguals. So that we can't just multiply monolingual proficiency and then we understand what the multilinguals are. I think this is all pretty uncontroversial. There's a lot of disagreement in our field. Uh, and I will talk about the disagreement mainly and in, in, uh, focus on this because it's more interesting to disagree. It's not interesting if everybody uh, just agrees. So for instance, there's a lot of disagreement and there's an increasing movement in the field that actually because of the problems that I pointed out when I showed you my graph uh, with the impossible definition of multilingualism, because linguists can't define and draw boundaries between the languages, can't count them, so let's get rid of them. Um, let's not use those named languages anymore to refer them up to the multilinguals repertoire. Let's just talk about the fluid continuum of language. Let's not talk about language as a, as a thing, as an essentialized thing, but just about translanguaging, doing stuff with words and language in general, without drawing boundaries. And other people um, are more conservative and think, well, languages still may be a useful reference point, even if we acknowledge that it is difficult to define them and to separate them. And as you might have figured out, I am among those more conservative people. Um, in pedagogy, there is a big debate 
whether the multilingual shift, um, this you know this new way of teaching languages that is being implemented in many, certainly European countries, um, leads to better proficiency, to better to whether all these beneficial effects will actually. Uh, can be observed or not, whether they whether this pedagogy should be implemented. This is, uh, I would say, uh, say still highly controversial. There is also uh, an important um, debate whether our research should still try to be falsifiable in the Popperian sense that formulate theories that then can be can be empirically put to the test, not the theories or hypotheses based on those theories. Um, um, or and th th those would be people, for instance, from the, um, the complex dynamic systems approach, who would say generalizability is very difficult. Individuals are so different. Everything is nonlinear, complex, and very dynamic uh, in time. Uh, so these people would actually, um, well, have have a harder time generalizing. Sometimes don't want to generalize at all. So this, if you're interested in this debate, there's a recent paper out by Gabriele Palotti that is very interesting that um, taps into this question. Um, the question of cognitive advantages is highly controversial, whether they actually exist, what they are exactly. If you're interested in that, there's a very nice uh, stimulating talk by Thomas Buck, a uh, recent talk on Abralin. You'll find it in the internet with a very nuanced, I think, approach to the question. Um, um, I'm not going to talk about this. My topic for today's talk is, I'm a linguist, as I said, I'm not a cognitive scientist, so I am interested in the much, you know, uh, maybe simpler question, in a way, whether multilinguals are better language learners, and whether knowing several languages or dialects leads to better language learning and using, better, faster learning, different learning, that kind of question. So that's what my talk is going to be focusing on. So one way uh, of uh, going about uh, that we explored quite for quite some time in the past was we gave multilinguals language stimuli, texts or words in languages that they don't know, but languages that are genealogically related to languages they master. So here you have an example from one of those studies we presented, uh, this is Romansh sur Silvan, which is a minority language spoken in Eastern Switzerland. It's a Romance language. And we presented our Italian and French speakers, multilinguals with a text or words in this language. And we asked them different questions. But for instance, one question would be, so what does the word uh, you means? Which is a word in Switzerland. You know? So uh, referring to the text, and then people would ha have to figure out what that word mi uh, might mean. So somebody answered, it means lieu, French, uh, place, uh, and uh, the inferencing, um, so the, the person drew an inference based on knowledge of Italian, which is, you know, similar to uh, Romance, and yes, that's a correct inference. It's not just about being right or, or wrong, sometimes being wrong is actually quite interesting. So here, for instance, this person says, oh, this is regarder, to, to watch. Um, because there's a Swiss German uh, verb, Luege, which looks very much uh, very similar. It's not correct, but it's an interesting in inference. So that's the kind of things we were looking at. Why is this relevant? Well, from a policy point of view, you could argue that if everybody understands, for instance, in a quadrilingual country, in a multilingual country like Switzerland, where Italian is an official language, you could argue people don't need to speak Italian, but if they speak French and German, uh, but understand Italian, that, that would give a boost to the usage context in which Italian can be used. So there's a policy relevance there as well. And there's also, of course, a pedagogical relevance and a psycholinguistic relevance, understanding these inferencing processes, as many of us would argue, including Agnieszka, uh, tells us something about learning additional languages. And so, yeah, Agnieszka's work is very important because it is experimental work that tries to um, test the impact of awareness raising um, activities in language teaching that actually focus on this kind of phenomenon, on cognate languages and, and words. So there's quite a lot of research on this kind of inferencing task uh, in Germanic, in Romance, in Finno-Ugric, in Slavic, and probably also in other languages. 
Um, you can actually, there's two main perspectives on this. You can look at the linguistic distance. You can basically try to figure out how different the languages or the words can be um, to, and people can still uh, figure out the, their meaning. Uh, we did that, but I'm not gonna talk about it. Uh, you find references on the handout. And the other question is, what are, so who are the people who are actually good at, at doing this, at drawing this kind of inference? So what are the individual determinants? What is their linguistic repertoire? What are other cognitive measures that may play a role uh, in um, uh, doing this kind of task? And that's, that's the point that I will uh, be talking about um, in the remainder of this talk. All right, so we have two main candidates for for the explanation of variability in doing that kind of task, which in a way could be seen as representing very, very embryonic learning of a target language, okay? So we can, on the one hand, say it's the multilingual repertoire that will lead to good um, skills in this kind of inferencing task, or you could say it's cognition, it's if somebody is just smarter, has a better memory, or maybe other cognitive aspects. And of course, you also, you have to ask also, so to what extent are these two things actually related? And what are the causal relationships? Is the repertoire good for cognition? Yeah, how many, that's something many people would claim, or is it actually the other way around? Or is it just a correlation and we actually can't figure out the causality? So those are questions I'm interested in. Okay, so to answer, these questions. We did many different uh, series of different studies. And I'm just going to talk about cognate words now. So that's the third task that you see here. We presented speakers of German, some of them dialect speakers, some of them um, first language speakers of standard German, with isolated words in Danish and Swedish. And we told them these are Scandinavian verbs. We told them it's verbs. They were all high frequency and all cognate. And so they had to translate them. And we just scored them correct or not correct. And then we looked at their um, profiles. In this first study, we basically asked them, what are the languages that you speak and on what level do you speak them? My expectation was, as a multilingualism scholar, uh, I expected multilinguals to outperform. So the more multilingual you are, the better you should be. That's the middle graph here. Yes, there is a positive slope, so there is an association, but if you actually look um, a little bit more closely at what kind of multilingualism, you discover surprising things. Fortunately, that's, that was not the initial plan of the study. Fortunately, I included two items on dialect skills. I just thought, okay, so it might be interesting to, to ask them whether they are dialect speakers or whether they at least understand dialects. And if you, um, put this score, like a, a, an aggregate score of dialect proficiency in the model, that's actually the best predictor for this task. So it is basically how good you master the dialect. Of course, you master the German dialect, you also master, master the standard language, especially if you are a university student, which all these people were in Switzerland and in Germany. All right, and then also English, self-assessed English proficiency was also a significant predictor. So if you add these three predictors in the, into the model, it's actually the dialect that is the most uh, important one. And the number of languages is not even significant anymore, although I don't think that's really crucial whether something is, is significant here or not. What is important is that dialect seems to be something that fortunately I, I, I included, but many people tend to forget. So in a way, <laughs> That shows the problem with the monolingual bias. What does it mean to be a speaker of German? That's, you know, with respect to this task, apparently pretty meaningless. What is interesting is whether you have some other form of German as well in your repertoire. So there's a language zero, as I call it here. German is not sufficient to categories, so you have to include varieties. Um, so um, what I did not do in this study was I didn't measure anything cognitive. I, mean, I didn't, you know, these, these are just students, so you can assume that they are. Um, maybe in a certain range when it comes to cognitive uh, abilities, but I didn't control for it, I didn't test for it. So to what extent is cognition relevant to do the, the task? That's a question that we addressed in, a, in another project, in a larger project, together with colleagues from different universities. And what I'm going to show you here is basically Jan van Hofer's uh, thesis, which was one sub-component of this joint project. 
we did, again, a study on cognate guessing. So it's a similar task with only uh, Swedish uh, words. Um, 45 words presented visually and 45 words presented orally in, a, in headphones. Um, all of them had cognates in either German or English or French or a combination thereof. So they were all potentially uh, recognizable for our, for our um, uh, participants. But this time we didn't only ask them about their uh, repertoire, we also tested their English skills and we did a lot of uh, cognitive tests. These are just three of them, um, but we, did, we, we even did more. But these three turned out to be interesting. All right, so now we can actually answer this question to what extent cognition also predicts uh, the ability to infer these target words. And for the written words, to make it very uh, brief, what we find is that um, English, the English uh, proficiency, uh, the um, English placement test that our participants did was an important predictor, and intelligence, crystallized intelligence, was the other main predictor for the written stimuli. So the answer is not, is it cognition or language? Uh, it's cognition and language, and of course that is nice for me. I'm not somebody who wants to completely separate linguist linguistic proficiency and competence from general cognition, on the, on the contrary. I uh, firmly believe that we have to um, look at these things in an integrated way. But this is debatable, um, especially in uh, language acquisition studies. All right, so that's the written words. And now let's look at the spoken words. The picture is similar. It's again English and it's again uh, crystallized intelligence. But this time there's a third um, factor and that is um, fluid intelligence, cognitive mechanics. Um, that is a good predictor for the, this inferencing skill of these um, unknown but cognate words. If we look at the age uh, development, um, these graphs give you the inferencing skill, the probability of being right, of being correct uh, across the age, because this was a lifespan uh, study. So we tested people from 10 to almost 90 years. And so what you see here is basically how this ability changes with age. Age is just a number, I mean, number of years we spend on this planet. Uh, but of course we know from cognitive psychology that things in cognition change. And as if you know, if you're familiar with the literature, it's not just everything gets worse, uh, actually things get better. And especially crystallized intelligence that is knowledge about the world in normal healthy aging gets better. And this is exactly what corresponds to the, this curve here. It's a nonlinear relationship that goes up very steeply. So actually the young ones are pretty crap at this task. It's normal, their linguistic repertoire is still relatively small. It goes up steeply and then it still goes up until the end. So it's not that it doesn't go down. It does go down for the spoken stimuli from a certain age on and it's there's a lag of about 10 years. We know that cognitive uh, mechanics fluid intelligence actually starts to decline even a bit earlier. So these, um, these participants get worse in the oral um, modality, which makes sense because we know that cognitive mechanics, you know, keeping things in, in the memory loop uh, becomes more and more difficult. And because they only heard the words once, which is pretty difficult, and then they needed to figure out the translation, they get worse with age. But overall, you know, it's not just that the, the younger, the better, actually on the contrary. So um, crystallized intelligence and skills in a genealogically related language, that is English, uh, are important as predictors in both modalities. And then the cognitive dynamics is relevant for uh, the oral uh, modality. And especially in the written mode, um, surprisingly, in a way, the older, the better. Yeah? Um, so what we see is it's it's not multilingualism per se. We also tested a number of languages. It didn't wasn't uh, an interesting predictor. It is actually skills in related lang in a related language that is English, together with German, of course, and knowledge, crystallized intelligence. Um, we did also look at the, the structural overlap at the cognateness, which you can measure, uh, but um, I, I don't have the time to talk about this. But this idea that actually overlap 
um, of languages that you already master and the target language is the predictor for this kind of task is a very old idea uh, in cognitive psychology um, that actually transfer only happens as near transfer. So you can also only transfer cognitive functions if the tasks are very similar. And that is basically what we also find here. So these far transfer expectations, you learn Chinese and you will be better in mathematics. They're very unlikely to happen. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but they're quite unlikely. Okay, so what, what have we found? We have found that if there's an overlap uh, of the linguistic repertoire with the target stimulus and target language, yes, there is an impact of the repertoire. And primarily crystallized resources are good predictors of this receptive multilingualism task. Of course, you may say, yeah, but I don't want to draw any, you know, too strong inferences based on this because this is a relatively weird and odd task. Nobody learns languages by just guessing the cognates. Uh, that's true. So let's look at real language learning, not just co cognate guessing. Okay, and that's what I'm going to show you now. Again, as a reminder, um, the mainstream view, as far as I can tell in uh, in the literature, is the more languages you speak, if you're a multilingual, learning additional languages must get easier. That's what you can see in this uh, uh, quotation on the left-hand side. When learning a new language, multilinguals are typically better than learners who have only had experience with one language. This is the multilingual boost theory of language learning. I always find it surprising when in the literature, the, 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 when the literature just says that this is what everybody finds, because it's very easy to find many studies that find actual disadvantages or just no difference uh, uh, across uh, monolingual versus uh, multilingual or bilingual groups. And I think in a recent really interesting uh, review paper by Julia Festmann, who I think will also uh, speak in this channel uh, soon, she says, and I think she's absolutely right, there is no straightforward answer to the question of whether successive language learning does indeed get progressively easier. I think that, as far as I know, that that's as much as we can say. It's not worse, but it's not better. It just varies. Okay, so let's look at real language learning. So the last two examples of research that I would like to share with you are from a project that we call the LAPS project. And some of it is published, um, or will be published very soon and you will be able, you are able or will be able for the second study to download the uh, data and scripts so that you can have a closer look at our, at our analysis and do them better now. Um, so this is published, this first uh, part of the study. What we did here is we worked with uh, 115 primary school kids in the German speaking part of the canton where I live in Fribourg, that's a bilingual canton and part of it is German speaking. They learn French as a first foreign language and English as the second foreign language. So it's compulsory and this is the state school. So this is not, there's no selection. This is basically everybody goes, uh, uh, goes to that school and learns those languages. So um, we tested them in April, 2017 in the language of uh, instruction. It's a reading test, a standardized reading test, German. We tested their French at the same time with C tests. And we went back at T2 about a year later and tested their English because English starts later. So we wanted to wait a little bit to see how good their English is. So French after about 250 lessons and English about one, about uh, 100, 150 lessons. OK, so we have three languages tested. Uh, the last one tested about a year later than the two, than L1 and L2. We also tested cognition. We did IQ test modules. We did uh, visual and verbal working memory tests. And because we wanted to see, yeah, of course, linguistic repertoire, that's one thing, but let's look at the cognition, okay? So what I'm doing here in a paper that I wrote together with my uh, collaborator, Isabel Udri, um, we wanted to test the two theories. The theory one being the one that I just presented to you, multilingual boost. So the better you are in your languages, the, the larger your repertoire, the better you're going to be in the, in the additional language. And there's also other theories, not um, uh, formulated by multilingualism researchers, but more by psychologists, educational psychologists, like, for instance, Fred Genesee or Esther Geva in Toronto. And they would say there are underlying abilities that are relevant for language learning, full stop. They will be deployed in all language learning, but there's no additional benefit of experience. 
So that's quite a radically different view. It's not experience that shapes your um, additional language learning, but it is basically your underlying abilities. And in some of their publications, they even claim that most of those abilities or a lot of them are actually innate. I don't know, but it's, it's a completely different theory. So what I did is I fitted two structural equation models that basically correspond to these two ideas. Uh, on the left hand side, you can see this is cognition. It's a bit small, but you can see these are our manifest variables here for cognition um, that mm, represent or measure a latent construct I call cognition, co cognitive abilities. And we have the three tests in German, French, and English. So, and there's paths going basically from everything to everything else, which basically means, yes, there is an effect of cognition on language learning. Nobody would doubt that. Um, but there's also paths going from the previous languages to the additional language, okay? Whereas the other model is much simpler. It's basically cogn cognition that does the job and there's no, there is no additional path here. All right, so let's see which uh, model is better. They actually both fit okay. They're both good. They're both good models. Um, so I could write the paper either saying, oh, yeah, yeah, this proves that multilingualism is a boost, or I could say, yeah, this proves, but that's why I fitted both models when I compare them. So if you have two models that fit the data well, sufficiently well, there's procedures um, uh, that help you select the better model. And I'm going to spare you the technical details, uh, but it turns out that the simpler model uh, should be preferred if we have to choose. All right, so the cognition model uh, should be preferred. It's simply, it's more parsimonious, it's simpler, and it explains, explains the data uh, equally well, or if not better. Um, so um, uh, I fiddled around with the data. I also excluded uh, pupils who speak other languages at home to see whether the, these estimates change or who speak specifically the languages taught at school at home. The picture uh, always stays uh, the same. Okay. so. To sum up this little study, it is quite uncontroversial, and all our projects have shown it, that there is an effect of cognitive variables on language learning and skills in additional languages. Um, in this study, there seems to be no noteworthy additional effect of being multilingual or of the, the, the skills, the multilingual skills for additional language learning. Of course, I have to do this always. You always always need to do that. It's very difficult to talk about causalities here uh, because, uh, you know, these standardized estimates don't tell you anything about causal relationships. They just, they just tell you to what extent constructs are associated linearly or not. So the cognition is basically now theory and you can't experimentally uh, test these things. You can't just say, okay, so let's take a, a random sample of pupils and we don't teach them languages and to the others we teach languages and then we see who, who gets better in learning English after a, a certain time. Uh, you can't do that for ethical reasons, also for practical reasons. Another uh, thing that you might ob object to this is, yeah, this is all fine, but this focus on cognition and just the language repertoire doesn't you know, do justice to modern language teaching. You have to take into account also effective variables, whether these pupils are motivated or their uh, effective uh, dispositions. And that's what we did in the last project I would like to uh, show you. The, the second part of the LAPS project um, with a larger sample here in a different area, but also German speaking Switzerland, but this time English is the first foreign language and French the second. They're about the same age. And again, we tested language this time with a uh, Oxford Young Learners test. And we ran a whole battery of psychometric uh, tests. And we asked them a lot of questions about their parents about, uh, we also asked the parents questions and the teachers and about motivation, about um, income, about how they live, about whether they read to their kids, that kind of thing, how many books they have, um, all kind of information about the background. All right, because um, I forgot to tell you that, um, there's, so there's the idea that you're multilingual, you're gonna be better at additional language learning. But from educational scientists, we also hear, in Switzerland, oh, this um, curriculum is overburdened. The standard curriculum in schools is overburdened with languages. And because we have quite a substantial proportion of migrant children uh, in our classes who speak other languages at home, for them learning three languages, the language of education and two foreign languages is too much. They're overburdened. So it's actually two theories. One's, one says 
they should be better learning additional languages and the other says they're going to be overburdened. So let's look at the results here. So um, to what extent does family background, among other things also, whether kids speak other languages at home or not, predict skill in the target foreign language? So descriptively, if you look at the left panel here, what you see here is just the English score at T1, the first time of testing. And what you see here is whether the kids speak German as one of the languages at home, any kind of German dialect or standard, or not. And those who do are slightly better than those who don't. And of course, you could test this and it would most certainly be significant, but that's not relevant here because we know that things are a lot more complicated and we have all this information about these pupils in our project. So we have to do a slightly more sophisticated statistical analysis. But descriptively, it even looks like the more monolingual kids seem to be better uh, learning English than the multilingual kids with often with a migrant background. Migrant background in Switzerland can also mean from Italian speaking or French speaking parts of the country. So it doesn't have to be foreigners. All right. So um, I fitted again a structural equation model um, and I'm not gonna explain to you all the details. You don't need to understand them. You just have to believe me that this is not something I just came up with, but that it is actually validated by factor analytical steps that I won't show you here. So we have four constructs here. The first down here, is what we call cognition, which is basically all these cognitive measures, working memory, intelligence, and other things, but also language ability, language learning aptitude tests that we did. Uh, so the ability to quickly map, you know, um, words, uh, words to phonological forms or remember them or um, infer doing inferences in an unknown artificial language, that kind of thing. Um, the second construct here is what we call academic emotion. It's basically effective uh, questions, uh, um, intrinsic motivation to learn a language, but also anxiety, whether kids are an anxious expressing themselves in, uh, in, in, in the foreign language class um, and the self concept they have of themselves as learner of the target language English. The third construct here is cultural predispositions of the hopes, which basically means how educated are the parents, how many books, um, uh, that kind of question, um, and also whether they speak the local language at home, which for me is part of the cultural um, the, part of the cultural background, if you like, cultural capital, as Bourdieu would call it. Um, and then economic predispositions, you know, savings, uh, income, um, um, wealth, basically. Okay, and all of this. So the question is, to what extent do these things actually predict English as the English skill at T1. And I won't you know, explain all these estimates now to you, uh, but it turns out that if we control for these four um, aspects, what you find is that these two predispositions, so the cultural and the economic predispositions, no longer play a direct role for learning English. What they do, however, is they are uh, quite strongly associated with the cognitive variable here, and to some extent also with this emotional variable here. So they have, I'm not saying they don't have any impact, but they, if they have an impact, it's an indirect impact via cognition. Cognition, on the other hand, is strongly associated with English and also the emotional aspects are associated with English. And now, and that's actually the reason why I'm showing you this is that I singled out now the question whether these kids speak German at home, yes or no, um, so that you can see what remains if, I, account for all of this, what remains as an impact of being a speaker of German at home, yes or no, and the impact is basically zero. There's nothing left. So basically, what this tells us, this question of speaking the target language at home, yes or no, is irrelevant um, if we control for everything else, which is quite complicated. I can tell you these poor kids had to do a lot of testing. Okay, so if we uh, control for background constructs as those, as I, I just explained, no not, noteworthy estimates remain from this background to English. There's no specific effect of being a speaker of the local language or not, therefore being more or less multilingual. Um, and when we control um, uh, for all of this, there's no multilingualism effect left. All right, so I'm summing up now the whole talk. 
uh, and I know you're probably bored of this of this figure here, but I, I can I can assure you it's the last time you see it. So what what we find in many projects we did more projects, but what what we find consistently is yes there is the linguistic repertoire plays a role, but transfer, massive transfer can only be shown if there's a high degree of overlap of the learned of the acquired languages with the target stimuli or language overall. Um, previous learning therefore is not completely irrelevant, but it is so it's but it's not just previous learning across the board that will determine the outcome in the target language. On the other hand, there we've we see consistent effect of cognition as soon as we test for cognition. And um, this, these multilingual boost effects are arguably not just effects of the linguistic repertoire, but of some kind of um, working together of, of cognition and uh, the repertoire. And if I had to choose, uh, my, my impression is that um, if I had to choose which one is more important, I would say probably cognition is more important because it's as Esther Geva would say, as Genesee would say, it is underlying all learning or language learning, as far as I can tell. So, as I already mentioned, multilingualism effects are hard to test experimentally because in many contexts, at least in my context here in Switzerland, Multilingualism is just a fact of life. Multilingualism is it's not that people become multilingual because that they think languages are so wonderful. It's just, I mean, I couldn't survive just speaking my native dialect. That would be not, not a very interesting life to live. So, you know, you just have to become multilingual in many contexts. Speakers of minority languages even more so. So it's just a fact of life. And it's very difficult to do experimental studies that, you know, really test uh, multilingualism or bilingualism as a as a condition on learning additional languages. So multilingual is just a fact of life for, for many of us, it has been in the past, it's nothing new uh, and not a choice. So coming back to my initial slide here. So we're doing research in a field that is highly ideological where we have biases and I only mentioned two, there's many more. And so to sum up, um, I can completely understand why many scholars see themselves as martial art scientists, like uh, Boudieu said, research as martial art, which doesn't mean anything is allowed. On the contrary, the, but um, you know, it is a, say, a sport de combat. So the, you're very engaged. You want to defend the status of your minority language or dialect or of a specific type of bilingualism, the, the rights of migrants, whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and it is a legitimate reaction, I guess, to extreme monolingualist ideologies. Uh, the problem is that there's many forms of activism out there now, so there's actually even conflicts among activists on what you know, should be given priority. Um, I'm not saying that activism is a priori incompatible with doing research. However, for me, I'm still, you may find this very old fashioned, but I still strive for axiological neutrality as Max Weber called it. Uh, because I just see the damage that the biases do. Uh, in other words, I still think I, I would like my research to be relevant. Let's put it that way. I'd like to, my research to be relevant regardless of my political ideas and social uh, um, uh, ideologies. So completely regardless of what I think about how the perfect society should be, I hope that what we're doing is a meaningful contribution to multilingualism research as a field where we investigate the multiple language learning, okay? So, um, because I just see that biases can actually undermine our discipline. Um, that could give you concrete examples, and I've written about this, where there's such a strong multilingual boost bias, together with this idea that multilingualism is good for the political development of the country, that um, promises are made and curricula are planned based on those assumptions. And then if you look at the educational outcomes, it, the transfer, the boost doesn't happen, which is what we see in Switzerland. And that's, of course, very problematic because then the policymakers will say, yeah, your linguist told us that this was going to happen. It's not happening. So I think we're, we should be slightly more cautious with our enthusiasm about the, what we expect multilingualism to do, which is not to say that I don't like multilingual. I love multilingual. I'm not multilingual. But not, not everybody is like me, fortunately, you would say. Um, and I also think that we should also think of other values of multilingualism, not just 
you know, what can it do for society or what can it do for multiple language learning, but maybe also other values, um, more general values. And, and that's perfectly legitimate to think about those things as well. Um, so, yeah, I hope that I've given you some insight in the way we do research. And I thank you very much for your attention. And I'm curious to see whether there are going to be questions uh, um, in the YouTube channel or anywhere else. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rafael, for this, this very inspiring talk. And I just wanted to ask if there are any, any questions. I can see I can see a question on the on the YouTube channel uh, from Professor Agnieszka Sharkowska, and she says the following. I was wondering which English proficiency test you use to test reading and which one you would recommend. Oh, that's a good question. So, I mean, I'm happy to send you our stuff. So the, in the last study, we actually used the Oxford Young Learners Test. Um, you can see it online. So there's, there's not a specific reading module. It's, if I remember correctly, we do so many tests. I think it's a listening module and general language use, which also involves reading, of course. So that's what we did for English. The reading test I mentioned, maybe that was too quick and not clear, was a standardized uh, German reading test. And for French, we used um, C-tests, just uh, you know, a standardized uh, procedure of reading tests. Uh, there's another question from Breno Silva, who says, uh, and I was wondering whether we can have access to the intelligence measures you used. I mean, the tests you used to derive the variables to control for cognition, working memory, aptitude, etc. Yeah, so the, 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 the psychometric tests are all, we didn't invent anything. They're all either completely standardized, just parts of standardized test batteries, or adaptations. So for instance, the visual working memory, we did uh, on an experimental platform, we adapted the Corsi blocks procedure. Uh, yes, it's, it's all in the publications. And yeah, most of these tests are standardized. Uh, sometimes we didn't do the whole test, just, just a short version for the sake of time. And for language aptitude, that's a tricky one. We actually have an ongoing project where the same problem is, um, um, actually we have the same problem again. There is in the languages that we need, there is nothing and standardized and the standardized tests like the MLOT or the PLAB are not, not always readily available. We had very good contact with the, uh, the company that sells them, sells them and we got the permission to do some adaptations and translations of, those, of, of some modules of those tests. I'm happy to share um, as much information with you as I can, just send me an email. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple more questions from the same uh, from the same person. I think it is Professor Michał Paradowski. Rather than the constructs failing to influence performance, may it be that it's the measures, so ravens or self-assessment, that do not exactly reflect fluid intelligence or multilingual repertoire. So maybe the tests fail us. All tests. Uh, have measurement errors. There's absolutely no doubt about that. So you're mm -hmm. right. Um, we just took the best tests at hand. I mean, that, but that's that's a standard disclaimer that you uh, have to do. You you. That's why I'm um, delib. I mean, that's you know the, the, the scholars in this field deliberately do not say we have measured uh, the construct. What we have measured is a manifest variable with a certain measurement error that is by the field considered a manifest measure of something relevant for the construct. But the construct is latent. You cannot measure the construct directly. You always have to do access it indirectly. That is, so your point is absolutely true. Uh, I just don't know what to do. So either you say, well, this is all irrelevant. We don't test at all. If you want to test, you just have to live with the compromise. Uh -huh. the measurement error. Uh, we have we have some 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 more examples here. So uh, the, the the same person says we we found that the number of languages spoken does not matter for third language acquisition uh, success, but cumulative competence in background languages does. Yeah, I tried that too. Like adding up, uh, although it is from the measurement point of view, it's it's a bit weird adding up. Like for instance, European. A frame of reference levels and just you know giving them numbers and adding them up um 
you can do it. I tried to do it. So for instance, in the very first study I showed, I did, I did that too. It basically, the, the linear association was exactly the same as with a number of languages, but you're right, you can do that. And if you have very um, unbalanced proficiency, it may give you more relevant and more precise information about the, about the repertoire. That's right, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, may I ask a question too? Because I, I, I've been mm -hmm. reading those questions. Yeah, I was I was thinking about that, that. Perhaps you know, linear models don't quite reflect the reality. Maybe we should start using slightly different statistics. Yeah, or... we did. We did. We did. I mean, as you've seen, I mean, for instance, the age that was a, a non-linear model. Yeah. Yeah. We did try GOMS, yeah, general generalized additive mm -hmm. model. Jan is you know, Jan van over whose whose work I refer to. Um, and did that. We also did it in other projects. So wherever it is possible, we do it. Um, I have to say, very often the association is is pretty linear. Um, so, for instance, in the labs project, I I did check whether there were you know like some something happening on some kind. Of, that, that would be evidence for for instance for thresholds. There's this idea out there that there are you know you need to come to a certain threshold and then everything will explode or or not. Or and I did so wherever it was possible, I tried it. I didn't find any strong evidence beyond the age. Of course, age is a nonlinear predictor, but, but um, uh, this, other than that, I didn't find anything uh, important. Okay, okay, right. So, so the, the, there's an interesting discussion here between Michał Paradowski and Tomasz Tomasz Bonk, so Thomas, Thomas Bank that, that you that you <laughs> that you actually mentioned in your in, in your talk, but I think they are just just chatting here, okay, about the interesting results. So I will read the next question. Uh, may it be that immigrants in Switzerland are more likely to have relatively higher socioeconomic status or cultural capital than in other countries? Mm, I don't think so, but basically the model I've shown you. Uh -huh controls for that. I mean, it's, uh, it accounts for the for variability of, you are of course right that there is, you know, I mean, immigrant is a, is a very, is a strange term, is a very interesting mm -hmm. term. I think when I said immigrants, I mean, for the sake of brevity, I refer to, you know, the debate is always about the, the, the problematic immigrants. Of course, it's not about expats, uh, you know, wealthy people coming in, working in the tech industry or in the pharmaceutical. So it's, it's, it's more, it's blue collar migration that is, perceived as being problematic in those debates. Um, but no, I mean, it's not true that there's only rich people coming. I mean, I know that people think that everybody in Switzerland is a millionaire, I can assure you. I'm not. Uh, Aren't I'm not, you? Uh, <laughs> and you have good chocolate. Not, it's not, yeah, yeah, it's not just rich people coming in. So no, and this is, and again, and this, is a, this is a state school. This is not private school. So this is really schools with very, very high percentages or very, you know, quite considerable heterogeneity uh, in an urban context uh, in the second study. So yeah. Okay, another question comes from Nicole Marx. Uh, uh, thank you. The reminder that it can be dangerous to instrumentalize languages, for instance, in some German states, funding for heritage languages was cut after students did not show significant gains in German. That's yes, what, it's a comment rather than a question. Yeah, and I think it's a very, and that is why, uh, if you know, Nicole, that's why I made the last point. Uh, in my presentation, that's why I think that's exactly what I mean, that we undermine our own position as researchers, but also maybe we might also undermine our ideological position if we have these transfer expectations and then they are not met. Um, and that's why I believe that when we talk about these heritage languages, we should think about other values. I'm not against you know, thinking about values also as scholars, but it shouldn't be just those instrumental values because as far as I can tell, and you know, some of you may know that we also work on heritage languages. Um, these transfer expectations are just rarely, rarely met, you know, in, 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 in the empirical reality. So I think I, I totally agree, but that's that. So both are actually true. That's why we must not make false promises that, of which we know by now that they're not going to be fulfilled by reality um, uh, and think about other values uh, of, of multilingualism. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's the point where I actually agree with the multilingual, if you like, if the, for instance, the multilingual, the view on multilingualism of the Council of Europe. I think it is, you know, it is relevant for our societies uh, to think about these migrant languages in terms of values. 
but that's my personal that's a political view that's my personal view uh, I again what is important for me is that my scholarly work is not biased by this ideological view on the things mm -hmm. Sure, thank you. Okay, there's another question from Renata P Peskova. Uh, thank you for this informative presentation. I wonder if you have any thoughts on the use of multilingualism for language teaching? Um, thoughts, yes, but I don't have any robust evidence. I mean, that's exactly, that's why we need exactly mm -hmm. the kind of research on Yeshka does. And that's why we need, you know, field experiments and tryouts. I mean, I have thoughts. I could also talk about, you know, some of the, our institute does quite a lot of large scale assessment. So we can actually compare the old way of teaching languages in a more monolingual perspective and the new way, which is highly influenced by this idea about multilingual language teaching. I could talk about this, but th this wasn't my talk. And I, I am very cautious uh, when it comes to causality, um, you know, because things change, the, the teaching paradigm changes, but other things change as well. So can we really draw conclusions based simply on the change in teaching paradigm? Uh, but there are some studies, some of my students actually did uh, do studies. So one of them, for instance, investigated um, reading skills in French as a foreign language taught in a more monolingual perspective and in a more multilingual perspective. And, and the result was that the monolingual perspective was clearly better. But I mean, but that's just one study. And I'm not saying we should draw uh, hasty conclusions based on that. But there is studies out there. And we need more studies that actually tap into different ways of teaching um, and, and, the, and, and their effect on not only what is learned, but maybe also how it is learned. Mm -hmm. Yes, another question comes from Martin Testa. Uh, in your study from 2008, you mentioned that dialect proficiency was a better, uh, sorry, uh, was, was a better predictor of cognitive recognition than the total number of languages spoken. Uh, do you think that people who master several dialects or several registers of the same language may be used to paying attention to more subtle differences than people who speak two distantly related languages? That's an excellent question. And that is, I, I mean, I've written about that and that's exactly my theory i can't prove it it's uh, what i call abduction in in in, in mm -hmm. receptive multilingualism because it's an abdu abductive inference that you're drawing you're drawing on your knowledge and of course dialect speakers or speakers take the speakers of scandinavian languages take mm -hmm. the norwegians who are dialect speakers but also understand swedish and sometimes also danish although danish and understanding danish it's quite a challenge but it is possible so um um so the you you develop specific dia systems they are sometimes called with closely related languages that are very similar but then systematically different and you can draw on this you just know what are actually plausible interlingual dis differences you know that it's an an R can become an O relatively easily. That's just a minor change. But an R becoming an I, an E is, is relatively mm -hmm. unlikely because you just don't have it in, in dialect pairs. And that's, so what you describe is exactly, that would be my theory, but I mean, I can't prove that theory because it's all going on in our, in our, in our minds. But yes, I mean, that's, that's what, I, what I believe is the case. Yeah. So will you say, sorry, that, that, that's my interruption here, but will you say that it will be related to frequencies of, of, of certain constructions or certain, certain occurrences in the language? Because basically language acquisition is frequency based, right? So uh, do you think that when we speak several dialects, uh, we are kind of more sensitive to, to those, those frequency related patterns? Or? Well, luckily for the kind of thing that I've shown here, the cognates, Basically, mm -hmm. what matters is, yes, of course, I mean, the, 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 the um, corpus frequency of the words in the languages that you master is, act, is we, we measured it. It is a predictor, but a, a pretty bad one, but it is significantly, significantly associated with the outcome. But I think mm -hmm. your question is, is, is interesting because it, you basically point out another phenomenon of frequency, which is, of course, the systematic uh, um, occurrence of, 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 of sounds. Yep. And, they, and of course, the sounds in a language are highly frequent. I mean, mm -hmm. virtually all of them, except some borrowed in, you know, sounds. But so the, the, the vowels are high frequency, of course. So, and you, and because if you're a 
polydialectal speaker, you just know, oh yeah, we say, we say Strauss and the others say Strauss and then there's people that, you know, they say Strauss. So you just know that. And so you can draw these inferences more easily. Mm -hmm. Okay, there, there's, there's a question from, from Tomasz Bong. Uh, I was wondering whether the dialect ability, which turned out as potentially rele relevant in your studies, uh, were there any German-speaking pupils who did not speak Swiss German as well as High German? Yes, there were some I did. So in the Swiss German context, there are some speakers of Standard German who are from German families and who don't learn the dialect. It is a, we're talking about primary school kids. And in primary school, you wanna be like everybody else. So actually the German kids usually become by dialect very quickly. There are exceptions always. Uh, it's actually, it's a funny question because I wrote my thesis about this. Um, there are some exceptions that keep uh, speaking um, the standard language, even when everybody else speaks the dialect, but it's, it's relatively exceptional. And it is, it is more frequent in, for instance, in Freiburg, it's relatively frequent because there's also French. So it's complicated. So we have French, you have the dialect and you have standard German. And so there, there it is more likely. Yeah, there were some of these speakers, uh, but I, so I don't think it, it changes anything. I mean, in the, in the last two projects I showed. In the first one, that's exactly what I controlled. And those were not pupils, those were adults, young adults. And that's exactly what I, what I test. I mean, that's what I controlled for, whether they had dialect proficiency or not. Yeah. Okay, there's another question from Hilal Shahin. Uh, thank you for, for the presentation. Do you think results would be different if teachers taught in a multilingual way, meaning they actively integrate students prior linguistic knowledge into teaching? Uh, Good question. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, well, of course, I can't say I don't know because I'm, uh, yeah, I'm the professor of multilingual and I need, always, I need to have an answer always. So what I'm going to tell you is just that imagine that you of a highly heterogeneous class. And you have speakers of Kurdish, of different varieties, of Arabic, of Croatian, of Serbian, of Albanian, of African languages, of Swahili, um, French and Italian and Portuguese. I, I mean, I'm happy uh, if you can integrate those first languages in a, in a way that makes sense. I mean, this is amazing. Um, I, I, I just, couldn't make that recommendation right now because I don't see on a very practical level how that could be done. Now, there are people, so we did have a, a, an interesting project at our institute I was not involved where the group of researchers actually looked at what, what do people, the teachers do because they get this, they get this, they, they are incited to do exactly what you described. So they looked at what, what actually pe teachers do and how um, pupils then behave and how they perceive it. And I'm happy to send you the references, it's published. Um, it doesn't allow, I, I don't think we're in a position to say it's good or it's bad for, for language learning, but there you can see at least, you know, practices that are implemented, maybe also problems with those practices. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 so I was talking very, you know, extensively, but basically I don't know. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. I, I thought that maybe maybe Hilal Sahin's question was about uh, foreign languages. So so you know making connections between the foreign languages that is, that the peoples were learning, oh, like yes. French and English, for instance. Ah, okay. You know? Yes. Maybe maybe that that's my guess, right? Okay. Uh, okay. So sorry if I misunderstood your question. Um, yes, I mean that's being done in in our at least in our context, and and I think it makes sense. So for instance, if you have a lot of cognate words pointing them out, makes sense. But I mean, here on Yeshka would be well, well positioned. To, I mean, it's simply raising awareness about the cognateness, um, as far as I can tell, does not seem to lead to massive mm -hmm. gains. Yeah. And that's what you found. And that's also mm -hmm. what we see in our, in our um, um, assessment data. So um, maybe, maybe we have to try to find better ways of doing it. But again, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, basically, that was the last question, I think. If I can't see any more on the chat. Well, and if this is this is it, right? So, Raphael, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for this very, very informative talk thought-provoking and well I think we have to we, we, we have to digest it and we have a lot to think about during the the afternoon and evening and 
<laughs> the rest of the week, right? And uh, well, from this position, I would also like to welcome everybody, uh, everybody to the second talk that we're going to have next week. Next week, we're not going to look at, at simple facts. We're, go we're going to look at uh, the affective factors. So we're going to look at how difficult it is to express emotions in a in a foreign language. So next week we're going to welcome Professor um, Professor Jean-Marc Deval from the University of of London. <laughs> right. So Raphael, thank you once again for for being with us, and thank you everybody for for listening to the talk and for being with us for asking questions. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.